I want to start with Turkey, uh, not because it's my motherland, but because I think Turkey almost gives us a template, you know, that some other countries have copied in this journey. But before I do that, let me allow me to remind you uh, one of the data that was published by Freedom House recently, actually. They have drawn attention to the fact that uh, when you look at the countries all over the world, more than 60% of them today are electoral democracies, which means they have some form of elections, some form of ballot box, and people can vote, people can express their choices. And this, at, this at the first glance, seems like a huge or an important progress because in late 1980s, this number was only 40%. So back then, we had 40% of the world's countries, electoral democracies, now it's more than 60%. It seems like the world has made progress. But did we really make progress? Are these electoral democracies really democracies? Are they liberal democracies? Are, are they pluralistic democracies? And coming from Turkey, I, I hesitate to say yes. I think many of them are illiberal democracies or they have tendencies in that, in that direction. The term illiberal democracy was basically invented by the Hungarian prime minister. He spoke about the central force field. That is, everything needs to be centralized. A center should decide upon everything, political and economic issues, and that the center is one single person who is the center of the center who will decide upon everything. How, how can be this be a democracy? What's strange in Poland is that um, the, the political elite, the people who are now either in the, uh, in the government or in the opposition, are friends from the Solidarność movement. From, so these are old pals. They knew each other for, for ages. And suddenly there's this explosion of, there's this very deep division and explosion of hatred between the two camps. Luckily, we have a very strong mobilization of the civil society. Uh, we, we have huge demonstrations against this government. Because of this mobilization, because of the spirit of, um, of, of uh, resistance, I, I think it won't be easy for this, for the government to, to completely uh, uh, thwart the, the, uh, the, the, the opposition. I think I'm more pessimistic than, than you because um, just to give you an example, recently there was a um, research published by Pew Research Center and they asked the people in different countries a very simple question. Do you think, in your opinion, is it okay for the people to criticize their government? And, and Turkey was at the bottom of the list and it was only 52% of the people saying it is okay for a people to criticize their government publicly, openly, loudly. And it shows that almost half of the society thinks it's not okay to criticize your government. The moment you do that, you are labeled as a traitor, as a betrayer. And that's, that's a huge, huge problem. The question is not that I repeat whether you can criticize, whether it reaches the people, this criticism. According to opinion, for 60% is dissatisfied with the situation in Hungary. But they cannot express why are they dissatisfied, because you need to have a language for it. Uh, at least not, I do not mean Hungarian language, but a political language, a language in which you can express your dissatisfaction. If this political language is not available, then we are just drinking together with your friends in the pub and curse. Yeah, mm -hmm. that you can do, but that's, that's, that is, you remain cursing your government, is criticizing the government, but it has no effect. Is it a similar pattern in, in Poland? The, the biggest newspaper, the opinion newspaper, is the opposition newspaper, and it's doing actually much better now, so <laughs> that's a good news, <laughs> because people read newspapers more than before. There are many people irritated by the new government. The so-called government media had been totally controlled um, by, by the new government. Regime TV news uh, lost like 40% um, of, of, of viewers. Um, 
So I don't want to sound like, like someone who is totally enthusiastic. No, it's, it's, it's very difficult, but we still have, um, we are not silent. I mean, the, the, criti the critical side is, is not silence, and, but as I said, it's only seven months, so it's, it's, sure. it's in the making. You, you, sure. we'll, we'll see how, how does it progress. Yeah, we have a longer experience uh, I know. in that I regard. don't envy yeah. you. Yeah. This. No, don't envy <laughs> us. <laughs> Do you feel that, that tension between the academic world, the thinking world, with its nuances, and then the need to, to, to say something about politics? High school teachers, started to revolt. That's the newest thing in Hungary. High school teacher, that's a civil society of high school teacher, started the revolt. They are revolting, but the government promised everything for them. No one single promise was kept. I tell you why, because the whole school system became centralized. All students have to learn, for example, history from the one single history book, which will be distributed by the state and written by the authors of the state. That is indoctrination, especially nationalist indoctrination. Hungary is a pagan country, uh, unlike Turkey and unlike Poland. So in Hungary, the only god is nation, and the only religion is nationalism. The writers, the most of the writers are not nationalists. Most of the writers criticize this ideology, but their voice does not reach, um, I would say, the broader layers of Hungarian society. About Czesla Miloš, his, his essays left a big impact mm -hmm. on me. He predicted that nationalism was going to disappear, religion was going to become meaningless, because we were all uh, making progress as, a, as humanity. He was afraid of Polish nationalists, and he actually predicted that one day, these, these hidden or not so hidden tradition of, of this so-called national democracy in Poland will take over. And this is what happens. That there is this, because these national democracy in Poland, they never had power in, in between the wars. They were in, in the opposition, uh, bitter and, and more bitter. And uh, under communism, there was no, no possibility to express this kind of opinions, <clears throat> and now they ta take their revenge. Do you think there should be any limits to freedom of speech? I think that we should divide, make a division between public, private, and intimate sphere. Mm -hmm. And that a different uh, kind of norm applies to public, private, and intimate sphere. On the public sphere, I think you should express every opinion, judgment, you do have, that is your right and your obligation, and maybe others will tell you, tell you that it is dangerous, it is wrong also freely. That is, the public sphere is about public discussion where everyone can express, of course, has a kind of judgment, judgment upon my own view, I judge my own <laughs> position, whether it's good enough to, be, to appear in, on public with it, but in the public, there is no restriction. Uh, in the public sphere, I can tell about a writer how bad is his writing. <laughs> but if a friend of my, mine comes with his poetry and asks my opinion, I do not want to hurt him. I do not want to humiliate him. I will say, okay, I don't know, who knows, perhaps, etc., <laughs> something like this. And certainly, that I don't, I am not obliged to give my opinion, because, because giving my full opinion freely, my opinion, would basically, uh, in a way, humiliate the other person. I don't want to do that. So I think that the modern distinction between public, private, and intimate sphere is an important distinction, also from this point of view. It's a very dangerous moment. There's this very handsome politician in the US, Mr. Donald Trump. <laughs> who is just uh, abolishing the political correctness. And the political correctness is partly stupid and partly necessary because it, it corresponds to kind of decency. He's abolishing this decency. I am in favor of, um, of uh, having fences, fences against hate speech, against hatred in, in public sphere. 
I yeah, agree my... with this, but the fences should be fences, moral fences, not legal fences. But is, that is a kind of moral consensus yeah. that this is the limit, people should not transgress this limit. But it is not true legislation and prohibition in my mind. Uh, my question is more about the Kurdish minority in Turkey and what you think, um, as you probably are following. Uh, recently, they, um, the parliament voted yeah. to lift the um, immunity of yeah. MPs, uh, which was mostly um, to do with the Kurdish party, sure. uh, which is the only sort of um, legal and dem democratic voice if these MPs are imprisoned, imprisoned soon, which people suspect they might be. It will cause um, a serious problem in terms of democracy and, and the voice of such an import, important minority in Turkey. And I just want your views on that. I'm very worried, to be honest, because in June elections, we have seen, for the first time, a Kurdish or region-based party becoming a national party. And they, they came forward with very liberal values yeah. about minorities, about women's rights, gay rights, which... Which, is, which was exactly what Turkey needed. Point, yeah. But I think they have been squeezed, almost sandwiched, between, yes, both the state's ultranationalism uh, and coercion from above, but also the pro-violence forces within the Kurdish movement, mm -hmm. which also left the Kurdish liberals in a very difficult position. I'm against all kinds of violence, and I'm afraid that ultranationalisms keep breeding each other. I. I just, just to sum, sum it up, I think it will be a catastrophe if they are, they are arrested because you are literally kicking out these legitimate voices that people have voted for uh, on the basis that they're Kurdish or on the basis that they're critical minded. Definitely, we don't want that to happen. And I'm very worried about that, too, just like you. Why do you think illiberal democracy arises at this point in so many places, in such different places? Yeah. And secondly, what is the role of the European Union in trying to bring some order to this very fissile sense of nationalism? Our continent Europe has a very short history of, of liberal democracy. Southern Europe basically even shorter than in uh, Portugal, in Spain, in Greece. There was military dictatorship and fascism for a long time, even after the Second World War that liberal democracy is new. And Europe has always turned to dictators when it was some, when some problems occurred. When a, in a state of crisis, your continental Europeans have the habit to um, with a dictator or support a dictator, support the kind of Napoleon or Mussolini or something like this, or Horthy or, or something like this. Europeans have no frustration tolerance, haven't developed frustration tolerance. And frustration tolerance means that there can be bad times, there can be a crisis, not the migrant crisis. We will get through this crisis, but if there is a crisis, if you don't get richer and richer and richer every day, then they will lose faith in liberal democracy. I am Ukrainian, uh, probably only one here, so for me Europe is in war already for two years, although I feel that many Europeans still don't feel like this, but Europe is in war already. Uh, but uh, uh, going to illiberal democracy, it seems a role model for all three regimes is Vladimir Putin. Uh, also, only Viktor Orban openly admires him, and Polish and Turkish presidents don't say it openly, but probably in their mind he is a role model, and he calls his democracy managed democracy which sounds much, much nicer, better, more uh, acceptable, but it's basically the same as the liberal democracy. I just wonder why Viktor Orban came with his, these new words when there is already managed democracy in Russia for 16 years. So what do you think about uh, Putin and him being a model for all these three regimes and for all others in waiting? who are looking at him and admiring him as a strong man of Europe, or the world, the man to admire. I agree with you, and um, I, I don't know historically who, well, we, we know who Putin admires, right? There was Mr. Stalin before. 
output. And so there's a train of role models here, uh, a not very pleasant train. Um, but you, your remark is absolutely true. And um, I think even people like, so I, I suspect that maybe some Polish politicians who on the surface are very anti-Putin, but maybe at night they <laughs> admire. <laughs> I run a small publishing press here, and I would love to publish people who are finding that difficult. Are there any other ways in which people living in London can help their friends? There are many Democrats in Turkey, some of them journalists, academics. Some of those academics have been arrested. They lost their jobs just because they signed a petition, a peace petition. I think it's very important that we keep reading about what's happening in other countries, making their voices heard all over the world and translating their works. I, I think it's tremendously important because the other is, is a very dark tunnel when people think they're all alone and nobody cares about their struggle. I think that's a very dark tunnel. May I thank our, our, our wonderful panelists and you for your questions. I think it was a wonderful discussion. <laughs>